hide all the insecurities. Welcome, 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 welcome. Hey, welcome to the Jimmy Curve. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. About to get bumpy. You guys keep derailing me. I did, and I did it endearingly. <laughs> Will's got jokes. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Will is the Sarlacc pit. I love beer. I like that too. Pork broccoli. Snowflake. Hail Baphomet. Thank you guys for listening. I learned a lot. Keep up the good work. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Welcome to the Jimmy Curve. I am your host, Jimmy Putnam. With me, as always, is my co-host, Joshua Vossler. Hello, everybody. And not joining us yet today is my newly minted sidekick, Will Doherty. I'm really sad. <laughs> That's a good attempt. Will, uh, Will's going to be joining us shortly. He is stuck at work right now. Joining us as our special guest this week, my good friend, Eric Green. Whoa! Yeah. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on, Eric. Sorry. Josh <laughs> fucked up your introduction by sneezing. Thank you for that smattering of indifference. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, no, it's okay. Yeah, you're you got, on the show too. Yeah, you got to control your... Uh, now I fucked it up by playing the drop early. <laughs> Eric, this could not have gone more poorly. Good. <laughs> Will's not here. We can't get our shit together. I expect nothing different. This okay. will work perfectly. Let me. I'm going to try it one more time. I'm going to get it right this time. Joining us on the podcast this week, our very special <laughs> guest. God <laughs> damn it. <laughs> All right, I'm done. That was fun. <laughs> our very special guest, Eric Green. Yay. 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 Thanks, everybody. Yay. Oh, Thanks for joining us, Eric. By way of introducing you, it is now 1222 a.m., <laughs> Uh, we were going to start this podcast at seven o'clock, but Will has been out of town for a week and got stuck closing tonight at work. So we pushed this back to midnight. How you holding up? I am fine. I am actually quite good. <laughs> good. Well, it's good to see you. Thank you for joining us. I know you through improv, but you do all kinds of things. You've done yes. just about every form of live performance. Let me, uh, do you think of yourself as a comedian, an actor, a performer? Like, how do you, what is your self definition of you? Oh, that's horrible. I am the golden corral of comedy. I do a lot of stuff and none of it at a hundred percent. Uh, no, uh, I, I am a stand up. I, I dabble in stand up, but mostly I am a, I guess a performer would be the way that I'd say it. Like, I think of you as a theater guy. In in the sense that, like, in high school you have theater guys. In college I, you have theater guys. Like, you seem like one of them. I was a theater guy. All right. Yes, I was a theater guy who looks like he could be a football player, but instead I was a theater guy. <laughs> have you ever mimed? You ever done any mime work? I clown have work? done clown work, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right no. out of the gate with the porn past. Oh, uh, oh no. <laughs> oh, perception. <laughs> uh, what? Where did you clown? Uh, uh, well, Is it a verb? Yeah, you can clown. Okay. You, you can do, you can clown. <laughs> um, right. But I, I did a little bit of clown work uh, with, with high school stuff. Nothing... Nothing too intense or oh, weird. Okay, it good. was it was you know stage. I had a really weird experience with a guy one time where, <laughs> which is a terrible way to start a story. Uh, I had been working with him for a couple of months, and then we were at like this after party thing one time, and he just walked in in full clown makeup, just kind of out of nowhere, and I was like, "What the fuck is happening, <laughs> man?" He's like, "Uh oh, this is what I do," and I was like, "What do you mean?" And he was like, yeah, this is my thing, man. Like, I, I, I'm a clown. Like, this is what I do. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean it's what you do? That's not what anybody just does. Like, you can't just spring that on someone after knowing them for a couple of months. But he was, like, really into it. Like, it's the greatest thing in the world. We do parties, man. Like, it's the coolest. I was like, you have, like, a registered name and everything? He's like, yeah, absolutely. And I fucking avoided the shit out of that guy I ever have, since. I have to ask, what was the name? Shipwreck. Shipwreck the Clown. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Please tell me he was a pirate theme. I mean, there was nothing about him that was discern discernibly shipwrecky. Although, I don't know because it's like staring into the sun. I didn't want to look directly <laughs> at him. I And it shouldn't have disturbed me because there was nothing weird about that guy that I knew of. Like, he wasn't a creepy dude or anything. He was perfectly nice. But it just, that that freaked me out so bad. And I don't know, why, I'm not even afraid of clowns. I don't know, why was I afraid of him? John Hinckley. 
Yeah, they they don't have a good history. Let's put it that way. <laughs> like that's in in and in a lesser uh, sense, wearing makeup to me is is bothersome. I just like I don't wear like wearing makeup to me is extremely off putting. Like both for me, but also like on women. I just I don't like makeup. Like Mary, like, my wife never wears makeup, and when she does, it seems strange. But I think I'm the weird one there. No, I mean, for some, especially with clown makeup, because that's a heavy <laughs> duty kind of makeup. It's literally taking away the features of a face that is, you know, right. what makes it distinct. So I, I definitely understand that feeling. Now, as far as a, a woman putting on a heavy amount of makeup, I, I will admit. There's that, just something inherently disingenuous about it. Yeah, to me. it feels like they're hiding something. Right. Now, it's just, I think that's my own insecurity playing itself out against the backdrop of an innocent world. Eric, you do you do like a lot of theater. You do community theater. I, do... I do. I do community theater. I, I try to get it in whenever I can. Throw out some names of places that you perform. Oh wow! Or let's, companies let's, you work with. Let's go through the resume here. Uh, I've done a couple of shows at the Playhouse, uh, both on stage. I, I spent the a lot of Omaha time. Omaha Playhouse. The Omaha Community Playhouse. Not, correct. Not the strip club. Oh, isn't there a strip club called the Playhouse? Uh, there, there is. You mean that performance art center, which is how <laughs> they get around the law? Oh, is that what it can uh, do? That's what made me laugh. Uh, that's and awesome. actually, uh, at one time, I was a janitor at the Omaha Community Playhouse. Awesome. But I would forget to emphasize the Omaha part. So I would always <laughs> right. go, I'm a janitor at the Playhouse. And then I have to stop and go, <laughs> the theater Playhouse, the one in Omaha. Right. Awesome. Okay. Uh, I've also done some of the Blue Barn. Uh, most recently, uh, I actually got in the paper doing stuff with the uh, the Florence Theater, the Florentine Players. Uh, yeah. What did Tracy. you just do with them? Um, I just did a melodrama, right, uh, with them, and that's what got me in the in the paper. It was fun. I uh, wore a black top hat, and I was the villain of the show. Nice. You are one half of the long form improv team. Nevermore. I'm three fourths, nice along guy. with Tracy Mock. Yeah. Which I bring up because most of us define ourselves through our relationship to Tracy Mock. Oh, absolutely. I feel like it's the best way to define myself. I, and like I said, I am holding on to those <laughs> coattails so hard, I'm just white knuckling it. Nice. So uh, you do improv at the back line. You do theater at the Playhouse. The Omaha, Omaha Community Playhouse. Playhouse. You do. You're also a member of a short form improv group called Big Canvas. That is correct. Along with uh, Tracy Mock, <laughs> Doug Rothgab, Heather Jones, and as of very recently, Lindsay Thies. That is correct. <clears throat> you got the you got the roster down. So you guys do short form improv with that group, uh, which I have guest performed with a yes. couple of times. Who, it he, was awesome, and he did awesome. I, I admit that. I loved, I fucking loved doing that, man. That was so much fun. I was really great. I rarely enjoy myself in the moment, in the act of performing. Yeah. Like, after a good show, I can feel good, but the act of performing is rarely pleasurable to me. Yeah, I saw the red moon. Jimmy smiled on stage. <laughs> that show was fun. Like, I was like, the, I, out there doing it. A couple of the games we played, like we did the the game where you have the lines in your pockets. Yes, God, it was so fun. So, Big Canvas and the Weisenheimers are essentially are the only two short form groups I know of in Nebraska that are consistently short form. Right, um, eighty eight uh, improv, which you had Tim. He mm -hmm. they will sometimes do a short form show, but they tend to keep more long form. Yeah, so uh, go see a short form improv show. Do you guys have something coming up? Uh, we do. Well, actually, uh, we have a monthly show. Uh, cool. I'm already getting into plugs, but we already have a, a monthly yeah, show. Uh, second Saturday of every month. We we tend to do things uh, for like the Loft Theater. Mm -hmm. uh, last year we did a, a fundraiser for the Loft Theater, and um, it was a great great fundraiser for them. And and they wanted to have us back, and we we literally did about. Uh, two hour show down there, uh, and so it was it was nice. a blast, and we could have gone forever. Uh, mm -hmm. We had so much fun when we did that, so it'll nice. be fun to go back. You and I did a very odd thing where we performed some short form games in front of the Boy Scout Jubilee. Oh yes, that was an experience. That was an uh, experience. That was my first. That was the first time I had ever attempted short form improv, and it was outdoors <laughs> in front of. Several hundred Boy, Boy Scouts, Scouts and their fathers. It did not go great. No. Of course it didn't. <laughs> uh, so 
this is my favorite memory of that day. So I just I had just shown up and uh, Doug Rothgab and his wife, I believe, were yes. sort of in charge of putting that together. And uh, I've known Doug for a while, not super well, but he's always been like the greatest guy. I didn't really I don't really know his wife at all. But as I was getting there, she grabbed me and she was like, now this is for Boy Scouts. So it has got to be clean. And she was staring like deep into my eyes. And I was like, "Uh, it's OK. I'm basically a clean comedian. Like, I don't really yeah. do vulgar stuff. And she was like, I'm serious. This guy. And I was like, what did she, what do you think I'm going to do? Meanwhile, Heather Jones is standing right, right next to her. Right. We literally have a device in our big canvas shows called the box. We might as well have just called it the Heather Jones box. <laughs> Where essentially if, if they say something that needs to be censored, they have to wear the box for the rest of the, that game. <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah. So. Oh, and we were opening for Smash Mouth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, awesome. that, that was the thing. I'm doing short form improv in front of 600 yeah. Boy Scouts yeah. opening for Smash Mouth. <laughs> and nothing about that sentence is incorrect. No, no, no. It was very, it was, um, it was, um, it was one of the worst environments for comedy I think I've ever been in. But it was like, once you jump out of the plane, you just yeah. got to hope that parachute opens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My, I did that, uh, comedy underground show. And it was there was a lot of people there, and my aunt had brought some of her friends. One of them was this gal who is like a a minister, and I just did my regular set. I did like a half hour there, and then uh, like my aunt texts me the next day, and she's like, "Yeah, she thought you were really funny. Uh, we're having a fundraiser at church, and we're wondering if you could do some time." I'm like, "What?" <laughs> Based off of my set, because I'm not like super vulgar but i'm not clean you know what i mean yeah i'm like what possibly could i and she's just like oh you know you could tell your uh rutherford b hayes joke i'm like what what's going on i basically just told her that sounds horrible but, i'm not doing that but the punchline of that joke is the fuck you did <laughs> <laughs> that's true uh, th th and she was like and you can deduct whatever you normally charge you could deduct it from your taxes because it's a fundraiser. I'm like, yeah, you don't understand how that's, comedy works. That's not how that works. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a professional comedian. It's not a job. Right. That's, that's not what's stopping. I don't put stand-up comedian on my ta like, like tax returns. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I didn't that, do that. That does bring up an interesting thing that I wanted to talk about, which is what is vulgarity in a performance? How much of it is acceptable where do you draw the line and what are the pros and cons hmm. specifically what is too much of a consequence and speaking of vulgarity joining us now on the podcast my tardy sidekick will doherty tardy speaking of vulgarity we want to explain just late <laughs> late <laughs> sidekick <laughs> arguably of near average mental faculties <laughs> Uh, okay, so here is what I wanted to bring up. We were speaking about just performance vulgarity because Eric and I had done a, a short form improv show in front of the Boy Scout Jubilee, and uh, it reminded me of a thing that hap that I that happened last night that I wanted to talk to you about. So Brad Stewart runs a weekly comedy show in Lincoln called Zularius, and he has a bunch of local stand ups come in there every week yeah and zoo do, bar yeah. it's a great it's a great show it's yeah. a surprisingly good room for comedy <laughs> right 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 but i i am very interested in the topic of vulgar versus clean stand-up comedy it's actually something i think about a lot and i think of myself as a clean comedian now we can talk about what the definition of that is because i, I do swear i use swear words but I don't really ever talk about like sex or anything in the bathroom or anything in the bedroom. Um, like I don't do blue material very often. Now, everybody's definition of vulgarity is different. But what happened last night but is... But everyone agrees that Will is within their definition of vulgarity. <laughs> well, I would say that you define yourself that way. Correct. But But here's what happened. So I was waiting to meet Will at a bar to give him his dog back. I'll tell that story in a little bit, but the, the important thing to know is that he didn't get the ransom. No. Uh, and while I was there, um, Brad, who runs that show, I, I, I got there and I went over to say hi to him 
And I overheard another person, <clears throat> some guy that I'd never met or seen before. I didn't know who he was complaining about Will's set. Now, the setup that I should, uh, it's going to be hard to explain this on the air. <laughs> I, it's the, already hard to explain how somebody could be complaining about my set. Well, <laughs> he didn't know who you were, but the, it was in the context of this guy. He was telling Brad how great he the show was. He was like, you know, he was saying, I, I've never been to like stand up comedy. I didn't know that there was like local comedy going on, but I've I heard about your show. Uh, this Zularius show, and it's great. I love it. He's like, everybody was great this week. And he goes, and I came last week, and everyone was great that week, except this guy who went last. And we, Brad and I, through asking him questions, eventually found out he was talking about you. Right. And he was like, he was like, it was funny, but at one point, he screams the N-word in a joke, and he was like, I just don't he was like i just couldn't take it he was like i couldn't take hearing that now the reason i bring this up now is because this is a conversation that me and you have had right before and you were the guy who couldn't take it well what i've always said about that is i will support the rights of everyone to say whatever they want on stage so long as it's funny and i'm not the comedy police and i'm not going to tell you what you can and can't say but there are consequences and you have to accept those consequences. And if you are a white guy who screams the N-word in the context of a joke, and I will say, it's a well-written, well-constructed joke. It's not a racist joke at all. And it is funny. But it does involve a white guy screaming the N-word. And one of the consequences of doing that is that people will be offended and hate you and not want to see you do comedy anymore. That's in my opinion. That, no, yeah, no, for sure. So uh, I wanted to, I wanted, first of all, I... It's weird that we're doing this on the air because I, my intention was to tell you that just so that you were aware that this happened. But now that we're talking about it, I mean, how? what is your reaction to that? My reaction to that is that, I mean, I'm, I'm going to make a prediction here. Now, correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, but I'm just going to make a prediction based on everything that's happened to me in the past. Okay. Guy, you said it was a guy. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm going to, guy who was complaining. Mm-hmm white guy oh sure okay that like that to me is the like i feel like this is an argument that people who are like genuinely racist and and by the way i am genuinely racist uh <laughs> that's not a racist joke i'm and uh i i say that that sounds like a joke it's not a joke i'm not intellectually racist i don't think i don't go around like going like I should join that white supremacist group. <laughs> right. I just know that I'm from rural Nebraska in an environment where, like, there were no black people or other minorities. They right. didn't exist. Right. So, like, I understand that I am fundamentally a racist person. Mm -hmm. Like, I view those people differently. It's not because I want to be or I think it's correct. That's just kind of part of what my life is. Mm -hmm. And I think being aware of that is the most important thing. I think most people who would argue that they aren't or that they are totally incapable of it, like, it's still in there. Like, we all live in this society. Sure. Uh, this is a completely different discussion, though. Yeah. With that thing specifically, like, with that joke, I do mm -hmm. have, I have the joke, and I scream the N-word in it, and it's in the context of a story, and a true story, and to me, you that's are important. Quoting, you are quoting somebody in a true yeah. story. Yeah, and I wrote that, the, the, that joke is based on a thing that happened in Chicago when I was living there. And it didn't I, – I tell the story as if it happened to me. Mm -hmm. It didn't actually happen to me. It happened to my wife, Serenity. Right. And she told me that story. And then I immediately told her, that's not your story anymore. <laughs> that's my joke now. <laughs> uh, but the thing – I did that joke in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And I had people complain about it there too. And 100% of the time anyone complained about it, it was white people. I don't think that's important. It's important to me because if I was actually offending black mm -hmm. people, I would need to like – it would be more important for me to consider that and go like, oh, is this a thing that's like hurting a racial minority? Like is my right. doing that making those people uncomfortable? Right. Because that's something – me making white people – uncomfortable about having to hear racial things i'm 
super happy to make white people uncomfortable about hearing racial things. Right. Totally awesome in my book. But you, you, uh, you, you're, you're assertive. I, I, I just want to interrupt for a second and say that, like, I've heard yes. you sort of explain this away this way before. And I think that your assertion that black people are not offended by it is not, cannot possibly be a hundred percent accurate. I'm not saying there no. are for sure a lot of minorities who will be super offended hearing you scream the n-word on stage, regardless of context. See, and that may that my, may well be true, and it's just po- and it's right. possible that just none of those people have felt like they were in a position to approach me about it. To me, what's important is that there are consequences for actions. And regardless of the context, regardless of how it's used, that word will offend people or at the very least make people super uncomfortable. And like your defense that it's not racist, I think is probably true or that like that joke isn't offensive racially to people. That's that's fine. I I don't think that is the important issue, though. I think the important issue is why are you doing it? Because you don't need to do that. You're a good comedian. You have plenty of material without doing that bit, yet you keep doing it, you, and there keep there continues to be negative consequences. He, he's doing it because it's funny. Yeah, but right, he has right? other jokes that are equally as funny. The, the, yeah. Well, first of all, the funny thing the funny thing about this story that you're telling about the guy complaining to Brad, yeah. Yeah. The, the, the beauty part in that story to me is that I wasn't planning on doing that joke that night. <laughs> I, I kind of just ran out of steam at the end of my set, and I think I just yelled at the audience mm. kind of like as a joke, like, any requests? Yeah. And Brad Stewart himself yeah. demanded I tell that well, joke. And, and, and Brad... <laughs> And Brad will is a person who will aggressively defend that kind of thing, yeah. and he did last night. Like when that guy was yeah. complaining, he was like, "It was a fucking joke. What's the big deal?" Like that's his stance on it, and that's totally fair. And I'll tell. And I guess the reason why I will keep doing that <clears throat> joke uh, is because I'm just self sabotaging enough to commit <laughs> to something like that, in spite of the uh, clear evidence to why I shouldn't. Another because... person asked me the other day if they if I thought they were a self sabotaging person, and I said no, and I used that as an example of self-sabotage oh i was your example of a self-sabotaging by, person by doing that joke i do believe that you are self-sabotaging <laughs> yeah, no, your own correct. comedy career you're correct I, and i guess it's that i feel like i'm still far away enough mm-hmm. like I'm, I'm in lincoln nebraska i feel like i'm still far away enough from anything that could be considered a comedy career in terms of like right. working in a legitimate way that like i'm not genuinely afraid of like really alienating anyone particularly right. at this point so now like it's just i feel like the only people i'm worried about dealing with in that context are other comedians right. and to me that's just a useful filter if i hear another comedian who hears that like you and i can talk about that and you can go that joke hits me the wrong way but you don't like automatically discount me as a person you don't do like no you know it's it's a separate thing and like when i hear another when i hear a comedian who would do that that's a useful shorthand for me to go we don't need to be friends. It, I, I, I am unwilling to dismiss the attitude. That's part of why you do that joke. Yeah. Is to get that reaction out of people. And you, to you, that is an invalid reaction or that re, for some reason, being offended by hearing you scream mm-hmm. the N word is upsetting to you, but you don't get to determine what does and doesn't offend people. It's not about whether or not people should be offended by it. The fact is that in our society, it does offend people. Yeah. And I like offending people. That's fun. <laughs> right, right. Like, I mean, I guess it's At it's, the it's expense of your own life. Right. Okay. <laughs> that makes no sense to, to me. I, I mean, it's, it's, the, it's, a, it's that to me, in some strange way, like, it's an ethos. It, 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 it comes yes. with, yeah. You're it, doing a thing that has zero positive consequences and lots of negative consequences to make a point. Yeah, you know, most people like. All I'm hearing from you is that, like, you have a lot of integrity. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you doing that? Well, can't most you people, see? Most people will risk. Like, that's a risky thing to do. Like that's a, that's just a risky kind of. There's no material. upside. That's the thing. Most people like risk. risk is, most people risk something for some sort of reward, right? <laughs> and you know, some sort of payoff. 
Sure. And there's so, none. See, the, the, uh, you, I think you keep – I'm not making an ethical point. I'm making a logic point, yeah. which is that – to me, what you're essentially doing is just continuously parking at parking meters and not paying them and getting tickets and being like, well, the fucking system is bullshit. Like, they shouldn't be ticketing us <laughs> for parking on the street. And my argument is like, but you know they do. You know going into the situation that they do ticket you for parking at those meters and not paying them. So you can't complain when you get a parking ticket. You knew it was going to happen. And I don't think Will complains. I was like... Oh, he for sure does. I have heard Will say, why am I not further ahead of the, as a community? He said it on this podcast. He said it to Heather Jones. Like, we started at the same time. Why are you here and I'm not? And my response has always been, because you scream the N-word on stage. <laughs> now, it's not a direct cause and effect, but it, I don't think you can discount it. What bothers me, again, I, I, I can't say that I've never offended like a mm -hmm. black person doing that joke. Because I can't say, I, I have no way of knowing that. But I can say, like I said, I've never had one complain to me. And people think that I wouldn't – like, people think that I think I'm doing a racist joke, I guess. When somebody complains to me, that's what they – in their mind is happening. Like, I've had right. people come up to me after I did that joke and say, you know, there was a black guy sitting right there. It's like, yeah, I know. We made eye contact. Right. He was laughing his ass off. No, no, no. <laughs> like, but Well, uh, I can tell you last night, that's not what that guy was saying. That guy was saying the same thing I said, which is I just didn't like hearing that word. He was he said specifically to Brad, that guy was funny, but I just didn't like hearing that word and it made me want to leave. God, I can't I can't decide how deep I want to go into this other story. Let's ask Eric how deep he, should he go? Uh go as deep as I think you need to. Get up in it. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's there's something that so profoundly offends me. Uh when other comedians specifically like mm -hmm. just other comedians really so i can't speak to like this other guy who's complaining to brad who's just some uh, some random audience schmo i don't know right but there's something that like offends me when other comedians uh like make a point to get offended by jokes especially when those jokes are clearly not offensive if you've bothered to listen to context. And I'm not even right. talking about my joke, like that joke specifically alone. Like you can make yeah. you can make a reasonable argument that that's just an offensive thing. Well, okay, uh, that that's that's what I think I've been trying to say is that regardless of context, that word is offensive. And like false. See, but this is not a rule that we can argue about now. It's I feel like it's just a part of our society. Like hearing that word makes a lot of people unhappy which is not regardless what offensive of, absolutely not regardless of context really like you don't you've you've never owned a nwa album you've oh, never owned a dr dre oh CD. no i didn't you mean, probably have no but. no i didn't mean regardless of context of the word i meant m uh, me me saying that word on stage into a microphone no matter how well i write a joke no matter how funny it is no matter how carefully constructed the set is will be offensive to some people. Yeah. And so are a lot of the jokes I do. I also do, a, I have like a five minute run where I just, just talk about suicide. <laughs> and right. there's a certain percentage of the population to whom it doesn't matter how good those jokes are, their brother just killed themselves and it's going to be very offensive to them. I, I see your and point that you're making, guy but not happened, the same. That guy uh, talked to me after a show that I did in an incredibly small town in Iowa. Right, <laughs> right. Is, why isn't it? I mean, why isn't it the same? Because our society has decided definitively that the act of a white person saying a hard in is unacceptable. I don't like that argument. I don't like society determining what you know, what's offensive and everything like that. Why Why does that matter? I mean, you're just thinking collectively. Again, I'm not making an ethical determination on whether or not it's right that they should do so. I'm just talking about consequences to actions. And right. if you're, he and knows. I mean, like, and if your response is like, I don't care about those consequences, that's totally fine. I don't vote in presidential elections. And to me, one of the consequences of that is that I really can't complain about the president. And that's acceptable to me. <laughs> If you're fine with the consequences, then there's really no, we don't really need to talk about it anymore. You understand exactly what you're doing and you're, 
you can you can you can go jump in a frozen lake naked, but mm-hmm. you can't really complain if you get pneumonia. Like that's you knew what you were getting into. And people getting upset, I think context is everything. I think right. people tend to not listen though, and they they're easily to get offended. I don't know. How about not trying to be so fucking offended? Well, that's because cause like, that's not up to us. Yeah. It's not up to me, but you know what? It, like, if you're not paying attention to the joke and you hear the N word and you just automatically, automatically dismiss the joke part of the joke and, and totally disregard any of the context, you know, and then you label somebody a racist or like a bad comedian or whatever. I know that like a certain, a certain percentage of people aren't going to like that. And I know that a certain percentage of people are going to like be genuinely upset by it. But in my experience, that group of people is all uh, really persnippity white people. See, and again, that's a group yes. of people that I'm not worried that I'm not upset about offending. This is this is the whole this is the whole part where we disagree is your judgment of the people who get offended by it. That's where I start to take issue because like we agree on everything else. We agree that it's not a racist joke. We agree. That there are reasons to push buttons. There are reasons to push boundaries. That's Can par- I- inspiring thought. That's part of what we do. The part where you go, oh, that guy is upset that I screamed the N-word. What's his problem? Can I can I make an argument? I feel like his problem is legit. Yeah, go ahead. Can I make an argument that speaks to your second point? Sure. It goes back to like a, a similar argument that I had that ended up getting me into a lot of trouble. For a long time in a way that I wasn't expecting. Um, but I got into an argument. It was around uh, a similar topic or a similarly touchy topic, mm-hmm. which was like rape jokes. Okay. Uh, which that became like – for that has at various points become this kind of specific sort of hot button issue. People who were like arguing about how negative and how bad mm-hmm. rape jokes are, I agree with – like most of what those people were saying, like we're 95% on the same page. But what I have a problem with and what creates a, what created a problem there was they would come out specifically against like rape jokes are bad. That would be the entire sentiment that they expressed. Right. And that's a very, very negative, unhelpful sentiment because talking about like making it's a it's a situation that just puts rape in another position where it's simply not okay to talk about and that's one of the right. most useful things in actually perpetuating rape culture which i believe is a real thing like i believe that's a real part of our culture and keeping it as something that's like shameful and not okay to talk about is important to right. that now we, I we agree on all of that i understand now when I see those people saying rape jokes are never okay, that's the problem that I have with that sentiment. Most of the people at like open mics who are like making rape jokes are making shitty, offensive, victim like harming jokes. Right. But in the abstract, somebody who can go on stage and talk about rape, and if it's in a way that isn't up like super negative it right. isn't in a way that's like victim harming even if it's not specifically positive in any way as long as it's not the negative thing then it's a benefit because it's just right. making this a thing that's okay to talk about and but, I'm but not- what you are ta- what you are describing though is the reason we have laws which is that there are lots of people who can drive really fast and do so responsibly and safely we have speed limits because most people can't. And, like, you are in a way punishing the most responsible, attentive drivers for the fact that most people in a society cannot be trusted with that amount of responsibility. And, I, and like, it's a weird analogy, but, like, I think rape jokes work the same way. Yes, some people can handle that responsibility and, like, do something positive with it, but most people can't. And I think that... I think that the attempt to make the rule no rape jokes was because it's easier to just make that blanket rule than to go through each person and be like, you can, can't do, you know, it's easier when running a comedy show to just be like, guys, let's just not talk about rape tonight. Cause like, I know there are people on the show who won't handle it responsibly. I, I mean, I reference, I reference rape in one of my jokes and I've never got shit for it ever at all yeah you're not victim shaming no like not but a- but uh, but 
there are comedians who do. And, well, most people, you know, most people who get offended at a comedian don't, like, you're never going to hear it. They tend, yeah. They like, tend to just walk away. They, they, right. It's it's very rare when someone, like, goes to complain. And, like, I, and, like, there's a certain personality type that makes you want to write letters and talk to the host and create trouble. That's kind of not what I'm talking about. I'm more concerned with all the people who just walk away and go home and think, if that's comedy, I'm not going to go see comedy. Like, I have so this, you- I have this argument with improv sometimes, too, where I'm like, part of running a show is taking care of your audience. And if you just scream the C word repeatedly during an improv set, like, it might get big laughs, but a lot of the people in that crowd aren't going to come back next week. Now... I, I I just think that's inevitable. It's just whether or not you care. I think part of the problem is is like the like Will's uh, offensive comedy. Like they people around here, especially they don't necessarily know what they're getting. Like I went to a Lisa Lampanelli concert, and right, you know what you're getting when you, you know what you're getting, and she f- crushed. Right, you know what I mean. But everybody was there for that. And I think I, I think if you were sold more, I don't. You can't brand yourself around here or, or be that just one type of comic. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. it works for her. She says the most offensive things ever and is made a lot of money doing it. Well, it here, strikes me is it the fact that we've had to spend the entire time having this discussion on this podcast saying the N word and without actually saying it because and 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 I was gonna say I almost said we'll just tell the joke. But my thought was, I don't want it on my show. Yeah. And, like, that can, man, if that offends you, that's fine. But, like, well, th- I, I, what, I don't know what to tell you other than that it's upsetting to me. And, like, that's not my fault. And it's not because I'm mentally weak. It's because it's an upsetting thing. I, I understand where you're coming from. Like, I'm not saying you're, like, a bad person or that you're, like, mentally weak. But I feel like saying that, it is, it's just an infantilizing thing. Like, we all know these things. <laughs> like, I mean, I can't, I can't say this better. Like, this is a Louis C.K. joke. But he's like, a newscaster on the news said the N-word. I'm like, you just made me say it in my head. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Like, no. we all know. Like, it's just a word. That's all it is. And the, f- like. You're a hundred percent right. Under- doesn't change it. I think that having this attitude, having this belief you know, because like I said, you, I can't say it and you're not gonna, you're not gonna put it out on this show if I say the word. But right. we're talking about the word. And to me, that's intellectually obtuse. It makes no actual sense. It's just a weird specific decision that you've made that we're gonna hide this thing. If we were all- Well, I didn't make if that we, decision. If we, well, you made the decision to not, like, that you're not willing to say a word on your show. But yeah. that's a society, and I understand that you are, you're trying to avoid, like, being self-sabotaging you can't in the way that I am. You can't blame me for, like, being upset no. hearing that word or not wanting it on my show. I that's bl- ridiculous. I blame, I blame our entire society for being so intellectually weak that we can draw this arbitrary distinction between hearing the N-word and hearing the word itself as if there's a difference. Because there is no difference. There is. And there is an absolute visceral difference between the actuality of something and the idea of something. There's an actual visceral difference if you're the person for whom the word is targeted at and it's being used against you in anger. That's like, or hate. That's the only right. time there's a visceral difference. Well, I mean, I would argue that if you're watching a movie and like a, a, a murder happens off screen versus like watching a gory murder happen on screen. Like those two things are different. And like, I don't want to see one of them. Like, I don't want to see that happen. It upsets me. I don't like, pe- like torture porn is now a genre of film and it's one that I do not like. Now <laughs> I just, it's, it's upsetting and I don't want to see it and it bothers me. And I think it, I, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say like those films should never be made. I also just don't want to see them. And if the director of that film is like, you're intellectually weak for not sitting through my movie. Like, you made a movie that it's hard to sit through, and you did it on purpose. So you can't blame me for being upset by a thing that was intended to upset me. 
that that that's a weird circular logic that doesn't make any sense. But here's what I feel. Here's the argument I can make compared to like it within that analogy. There's a director who's making a gore or a murder porn as you describe it, and he's like, his name weak. is Eli Roth. Yeah. Okay. We, we know. <laughs> um, the difference to me is that like facing like acknowledging with the murder porn there's no underlying reality that we're avoiding dealing with by seeing that like it's not like we're going into that murder porn and you're going like you know we're avoiding like intellectually dealing with the fact that there's vicious murders out there in the reality right by n like by being this culture that only like you you're allowed to say the n word but not the word we're being we've created this kind of like culture that's sort of denying the existence of the real racism that is out there by doing that by creating this slipshod like solution as if it's a real like answer to the problem and it's not facing the reality and I'm not saying that my joke is like doing is doing like to doing down the, the walls big of work. <laughs> yeah, I'm not equating that, but I am like I am saying that in like in some infinitesimally small way, that's what that's that's the positive benefit of that sort of thing. Yeah, like facing the reality, like that is real. I don't disagree with anything you just said. You're a hundred percent right. I'm not t I, that that's never been my point. My point has never been that like society is better or worse. Like I'm not arguing ethics. I'm only saying complaining about consequences of something that you did to cause those consequences <laughs> makes no sense to me. Like that do, do you see what I'm saying? Like I didn't do that joke at the funny bone, Jimmy. I know. I know. <laughs> well, why not? If everything that you're saying is, is how you feel, why not? Because they wouldn't have you back. Yeah. I feel like this whole conversation has been far more upsetting to Joshua than it has been to either <laughs> Will or I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, uh, I don't know. I think you should be able to say whatever you want, you know. Do it well, at your, agree you, agreed. You do, it at, do it at your, you do it at your own risk and, agreed. And, uh, you know, you say it and people don't like it and you had a fucking shitty set. If people liked it, you got lucky or. But what about if you say it, people laugh. But then you don't get to do shows anymore. Yeah. Well, it's your choice. We agree. I think that's only ever been my point. I would never tell Will not to say it, though. I've never told Will not to say it. I've told Will there are consequences of saying it. And I, I think we all agree on all of that. I, it's just whether or not you care. Like, for me, I can, Like, I... And, it, and also, you're, you're exactly right. Like, the vulgarity line is different for every person. Like, I call myself a clean comedian. But I say fuck a lot. It's just when I'm trying to be conversational, I say it. And that doesn't seem offensive to me. It doesn't bother me. For sure, there are people in the crowd who get bothered by that. And they're like, well, I don't want to hear that guy swearing up the joint. You know, like, I know that that happens. And I'm, I, I'm kind of unwilling to completely change it entirely for the same reasons you are. But, like, I am conscious of it. And if a person is offended by that, I don't, I don't agree that it's offensive, but like, I understand. I understand if that bothers you. And I guess, and I guess I'm less, I'm less sympathetic. And it's because it's, it's kind of because of the thing I said earlier. Like, yeah, to me, it's like, if that bothers you, my reaction to that is like, you, you're welcome to be bothered. Uh, but I want you to acknowledge that that's the choice. That's a choice that you're making to be bothered by the thing. I'm saying a thing and you're being bothered. That's a choice that you're making. That's mm -hmm. the, that's the degree of acknowledgement that I want. That don't put the, right. don't put the value judgment on the, just the word by itself. Sure. That, that implies though that people have the choice to never be bothered by things. That's kind of true though. Well, to be honest, there is a certain group where that word would not offend them at all. It's, it's just as good as a morning. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it, it really is the value of the word. It's the value that you do put in the word, which I think is also part of the Louis C.K. bit that it's running through my head right now. But yeah, I I, I think we're all agreeing. Send your this? comments to at Kill Doherty. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> Hashtag Kill Doherty. Uh, 
Will's inner monologue has been so negative for so long that it spawned its own Twitter account <laughs> independently of Will. I, I showed this to you last night, Will. You were unaware that it even happened. Yeah, no, I mean, and it was pretty, it was pretty spot on. It was, uh, it was, uh, supporting Hillary and against myself, which <laughs> sounds right. Uh, let's, I have a, I have a show idea. And then let's move on to, uh, some more fun things. <laughs> uh, what's your show idea? So, like, uh, after. After the last episode, like, I really like doing voices and stuff like that. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> so I thought it'd be kind of cool, like, between the three of us, we have, like, a, a bit of a, um, uh, an impression contest. And basically, the audience can pick, who, like, uh, an impression for each of us to do, and we learn it, and then we can do it on the show. Oh, my God. We ha So we have to do audience suggested impressions yeah maybe you're we, the only like both of you do impressions i don't do impressions it's voice. a challenge it's fun but yeah. it's just a challenge it's just like <laughs> this is my impression of a homeless guy i saw in chicago <laughs> <laughs> okay i'm down <laughs> and, and now and now i think it should be like a, a celebrity like it's something that's recognizable to most people now would all three of you do the same celebrity now we could do that or we could just like we could narrow it down, maybe three for you, and then uh, the audience picks just one of the three for you to do. And I think we should just each get a, a different suggestion. I think different would be cool. I yeah. think it'd be... Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, audience, make suggestions for an impression that each of us... Ha now, don't, don't fuck us. Like, don't yeah. do something that we just absolutely can't do. The goal is not to stump us. The goal is to give us... Something that, given a week of practice, we might be able to pull off. And you know what? We could pick one sentence. Like, don't give me Anna Kendrick. Like, I'm not no. going to be able to do an Anna Kendrick Honestly, impression. Honestly, I, I think you could do an Arnold Schwarzenegger right now. Ah, uh, I would want to do. I would want to work <laughs> on it. Cause, like, I can't. <laughs> I'm not a guy who does voices. <laughs> as soon <laughs> you you said like ah, uh, and I uh, thought you were going in going going for it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, <laughs> right. I honestly, and I would give you this advice as a person who does voices. Ah, yeah. Uh, find people, find impressionists doing the voices. Okay. Not the real person. Not the real person. And the reason why is because the impressionist has already taken a couple of levels off for you. Right. So you can get down to the essence. Like when most right. people do a George W. Bush, or uh, not George H. W. Bush, H.W. When they do H.W., they're not doing George Bush. They're doing Dana Carvey right. doing George Bush. Right, right. And, you know, like Christopher Walken. Mostly it's either Jay Moore or Kevin Pollock. <laughs> right, yeah. So send your suggestions to at the Jimmy Curve on Twitter or the Jimmy Curve at gmail.com or post them on Facebook. Um, so this episode's going to drop Thursday. Really seriously, guys, give us a suggestion. Hey, this will be fun. Hey, that was then. Now we have a Will Doherty parody Twitter account. Okay. Send your suggestions to Kill Doherty. <laughs> at Kill Doherty. All right. Let's, uh, let's find something to, to talk about. Let's find something to crack wise on. Josh, do you got anything? Yeah, a uh, uh, a man volunteers to be the world's first head transplant. Oh, I saw that guy. headline. Thirty year old Russian guy who has uh, like some chronic muscle wasting disease. Um, that's all I really know about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but they, but they are actually someone is going to attempt to put a human head onto a different body. Is that a real thing that someone's going to attempt? Yeah. Yeah, and the guys. Uh, that is lunacy. It's af it's a it'll be a thirty six hour operation. I feel like we sad. need more time <laughs> to add a to add a skull to a spine and get the nerves going. The patient would lie in a coma for about a month while doctors use electrical stimulation in an effort to connect spinal cord nerves to the new head. That is insane. But many experts dismiss the entire plan <laughs> <laughs> as laughable and dangerous. A monkey died after undergoing a head transplant in 1970. And, uh... Yeah, we have better diodes yeah. and shit now, but, <laughs> yeah, like, I feel like this is how a person is created to fight the Ninja Turtles or something. The guy, I... the guy is quoted as saying, well, yeah, that's true. 
but there's there are a lot of things worse than death. That is very yeah. Russian. One of them <laughs> is very <laughs> Russian. <laughs> yeah, but I, for sure that is painted on the side of at least one submarine in Russia. There is very much worse than death. <laughs> yeah, but I feel like what that guy is failing to consider is that one of the things that is very much worse than death <laughs> is uh, being like half like electrically connected to a body that technically allows you to feel pain but just doesn't let you move and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like – no, yeah, the thing that's worth, worse than death is the half-between stage with which he's rapidly diving. <laughs> right, yeah. I want to get a hold of the audio of all the lame, like, head-type jokes that the doctors are going to be saying when his head's <laughs> off. <laughs> you know, like, In Soviet guy, Russia, head transplants you. <laughs> you would be like, yeah. yeah, you'd lose my head if it wasn't attached <laughs> to my body. You know, stupid dad jokes. <laughs> Maybe I'm being uh, maybe I'm being a little semantic here, but this isn't a head transplant. This is a body, body transplant. transplant. Yeah. Well, oh, the no. head is the part that's staying. Okay. It's how not a bod to me. Well, Literally. how do, how do you define it? Like, obviously, the head is what makes you you because it has the brain. That's where your thoughts live, but I choose to let my smoking I, hot I, body define. I me. think <laughs> I know how to define this. Okay. Will he have the name of the head or of the body? <laughs> there is your winner right there. <laughs> Boom. Nailed it. <laughs> oh, man. What if this is, like, successful? That's going to be, like, the next trend for, like, celebrities that, you know, or My... somebody that wants to lose weight. They're just like, fuck it. And then they just give me a new body. Yeah. Well, oh, th this for sure starts us down the cyborg path. For sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, uh, to me, when I think of a transplant, like just this, how it works in my head, I think of like the thing that I call the thing being transplanted is the smallest thing in size. Like, so to me, I think of it as a head transplant because the head is smaller than the body. Like the thing that is the, the thing that occupies the most volume by water displacement is the base item. And the other thing is being transplanted, but you are putting a new body onto your head, which is how you define your. Yeah, it's. I see. The head is the thing that's staying alive. That means that the other thing is the thing that's being transplanted. Hey, you know, there's a whole angle of this that we haven't even considered. Where did they get the body? <laughs> <laughs> it's Russia. You don't ask questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They ha the the answer is they haven't picked one out yeah. yet. Yeah. So. Everybody, let's eat as much as we possibly can to fuck up our bodies before a bunch of Russians throw us into a van. Like, oh, I'm sure there's somebody Putin's not happy with. That's yeah, gonna be on a I was, yeah. That's what I was like. Where did they get the bodies? Like, well, someone spoke ill of Vladimir. <laughs> right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they just asked him. He's like, you want a body? I can get you a body. We can get the body. Oh, well, see, my Putin is from Chicago. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm worried about this impression contest. No, no, <laughs> Jimmy. Russian politics isn't that correct. Do <laughs> uh, you have another story? Yeah. Um, so a 65-year-old woman who has uh, 13 kids is pregnant with quadruplets. 65 years old. <laughs> Sick Gross. Quadruplets. <laughs> The For sure, she definitely took fertility pills, right? Oh right? yeah, yeah, yeah. But even if you take, even if you have taken fertility pills, that she still had four eggs left. Right. That is, seems or at least four four eggs put in her. That's the other thing you always have to remember too. Yeah. Right. right I guess she underwent numerous attempts at art artificial insemination f over eighteen months using donor eggs and sperm after. Okay. Her her young daughter asked for a baby brother or sister. Sure. See, this, <laughs> this, is, this is just another example of today's parents always just giving kids whatever they want. <laughs> Never saying no. Well, this lady is, you know, the the human, human body can go through a bunch of things. Like, George Foreman stayed a perfect. He won a boxing heavyweight championship at the age of, like, 50. Like, this lady is the George Foreman of having kids. Well, like, they've done... They've done studies, and and as women get older, the likelihood of mental retardation or health problems with the child increases significantly. Right. 
So, I mean, and, you know, any anything like twins, quadruplets, like they're going to be fighting for all sorts of nutrients. They're probably going to, they're not going to be healthy anyway. Well, and they're, they're, they're going to be underweight. Come, yeah, there also comes a certain time where just the act of having the, a child is a form of child abuse. Like, there's no way that kids at a certain point are can possibly get the nurturing or attention that they need to stay healthy. I mean, I don't know. I, I'm not a fucking well, I mean, child if psychologist, if, but if I listen to that correctly, this is child 14, 15, 16, R 17. Right. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I think they asked her why, you know, she decided to do it. And she just said, I'm trying to get my own show on TLC, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's how it works. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Which is <laughs> Either have a bunch of them or have one of them be weird and you're good to go. <laughs> Fifteen kids and actively dying. <laughs> uh, uh, that I'd watch it. <laughs> so you got one? No, those are the two I had. Uh, there was a great there's a great documentary. Um I oh, can't remember what it's called, so I'm not going to mention it anymore. Well, I guess that's our show. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we have enough material right now. I don't need to start talking about all the documentaries that I've seen. Oh. Um, as fascinating a subject as that would be, I'm sure you guys are dying to hear it. <laughs> Tweet me. I'll send you a list. Send uh, your request to hashtag Kill Doherty <laughs> on Twitter. Send us your uh, requests for our impressions that we're going to do <laughs> to thejimmycurve at gmail.com or at the Jimmy Curve, or send them to us individually. Let's do some plugs. What do you guys have coming up? I'm coming. Uh, I'm on the Fantasy Nerd Roast on April 25th uh, at the uh, Holiday Inn Convention Center. I can't remember where it is. There's a comic book festival. Uh, it's it's Contagion, I believe, is is the name of the place. It's Saturday, April 25th at 5 p.m. at the Omaha Comfort Inn and Suites. Uh, it's the Fantasy Nerd Roast where we're doing Marvel versus DC. So we're going to dress up as characters from the Marvel and DC universe and uh, roast each other. So it should be a good time. I just want to say, speaking as... I think it's fair to say I, I can't I can't judge Mr. Green. We don't know each other that well. Okay. But I think it's fair to say as the nerdiest regular contributor to this podcast. No, I'll, you're nerdier than me. I'll allow that one. Okay. <laughs> I feel like as the nerdiest contributor traditionally to this show, I feel like that's a good example of that thing Jimmy was talking about where that seems like it should be uh, a thing I would do, but they're afraid I'm going to go there and yell the N-word. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is, I am a little, like, you're right. That's a thing that I'm a little bit sad that I've never done that show. Uh, well, uh, do you also have any shows coming up? Um, if this is going to be out this Thursday, yes. then tonight uh, I sh will be headlining the uh, another uh, Brad Stewart production, uh, the his uh, weekly comedy underground at Brewski's. Nice. With uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chris Covey. Oh, good. Uh, featuring that, uh, a man who uh, beat me in my first uh, Omaha Funny Bone Clash the comic show. <laughs> Excellent. But now who's featuring for who, Covey? <laughs> <laughs> in the basement of a brewskis. Uh, Joshua Vossler. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, let's do some plugs, man. What do you have coming up? Uh, Stand-up-wise, I don't have much. You can just probably catch me on an open mic. Uh, I'll be there as, <laughs> as much as I can. Uh, like I said, Big Canvas, uh, you can follow us at uh, Facebook.com slash Big Canvas NE, uh, Twitter, Big Canvas NE. Um, my personal Twitter is mm. Eric N. Green. Go check out a Big Canvas show. It's hilarious. Yes. Uh, thank you guys so much for having me on. Yeah. Uh, awesome. So that'll just about wrap up our show. Um, thank you guys for hanging with us. Uh Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week uh, for our extra special guest, Eric Green. Hey! Yay! Give me a stick on the ice. <laughs> and uh, my sidekick, Will Doherty. I hope the opening segment taught you why I'm necessary. <laughs> and my co-host, Joshua Vossler. N-word. <laughs> <laughs> What? <laughs>
Way to lose the brown audience. <laughs> Thank you and good night. <laughs>